I just want to welcome everybody to tonight's talk about Eastern wild turkeys. I'm very happy to have naturalist and photographer Bob Michelson here with us tonight for this presentation. But before we begin, let me tell you, I'm going to mute you all as you enter the call. So please save your questions until the end of the hour or type them into the chat box and I will pose them to our speaker as we go along when it seems that's, like that's the preferred. That's the preferred method. If they okay. can type in there, type into the chat so I can answer the questions as we proceed through the presentation so we don't lose anybody. Okay, good. So I will soon open that chat box. Um, so you'll have the ability to unmute yourself at the end too to ask something. And I'm also I'm filming this program for Milton Access Cable, and it will be available to you at a later date. And I want to thank the friends of the Milton Public Library for their support of my programs. Now let me tell you about our speaker. Bob's work has appeared in numerous magazines, and he has been diving for 42 years. He's a Patty Dive Master, a specialty instructor in underwater photography and videography, a naturalist and a Patty Project Aware Fish ID based in Braintree, Mass. Hold on one sec here, you guys. I'm going to let these people in. Um, his company is called Photography by Michelson, and his website is www.pbmphoto.com, which I will put in the chat. And if, you, if you'd like to learn more about him, so check out that website. And now please join me in a warm welcome for Bob. Well, thank you very much, Jean. It's a pleasure to be back with you folks in Milton again. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the Eastern wild turkey, and I'm talking about the bird. Um, this is going to be about the life history, the habitat, the anatomy, the adaptations that the animal has for survival, and research currently taking place in parts of New England, along with how to coexist with this animal, which can be very aggressive at times, especially during mating season. Okay, let's first of all talk about the differences between domestic turkeys on the left-hand side, which are farm-raised birds, and wild turkeys, which are on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, domesticated turkeys are not allowed to run around or fly so they can have nice, tender, plump meat like we get from the supermarkets. And I'm not going to mention any names to not favor one over the other. Um, I personally will buy either fresh or frozen turkeys every Thanksgiving, and that's what we have for our Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, I don't hunt or hurt, harm any animals, so that's out of the question for me as well. So anyways, domestic turkeys on the left-hand side are raised on farm in farm environments to uh, develop nice, plump, juicy meat and not have a lot of muscle in them, which would make it for a lot more difficult eating, which wild turkeys do present. Before we start, the wild turkey is the official game bird of Massachusetts. Um, real cool fact to it is Benjamin Franklin originally wanted the wild turkey to be the national bird of the United States instead of the bald eagle. Now, we're, we're the laughingstock around the globe as it is. Imagine if we had a turkey as a national bird, the jokes that would be flying around that one. So I'm glad the bald eagle was chosen, a nice, strong, majestic predator. Uh, after the European colonization, Turkeys were pretty much wiped out of all of Massachusetts by the 1850s. Here is a chart showing uh, the eastern wild turkey is pretty much the entire eastern half of the country, east of the Mississippi River, the Great Divide. Uh, there is a subspecies of turkey in Florida, um, but the panhandle also has eastern wild turkeys. Uh, there are seven subspecies of turkey found around the country, depending upon where you live. They are usually a little bit smaller than the eastern wild turkey and have slightly different color variations depending upon where you find them. But this is a map showing the, the range of turkeys across the continent and especially here in the northeast. They're all eastern wild turkeys. Population over time in Massachusetts. 1851, the last known turkey was killed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, 1911 to 1967, there were nine attempts in five counties to release turkeys to repopulate, which all failed. In the 1970s, mass, mass wildlife biologists brought 37 turkeys from New York State to the Berkshires to repopulate the mass turkeys in that area. In 78, the mass wild turkey population was estimated to be about a thousand birds. They're very proficient. We're going to get into how proficient they are at reproducing. 1991, uh, turkeys are named the Massachusetts official state bird. And by 2002, 
the Turkey population in the Commonwealth was estimated to be between 30,000 and 35,000 birds. That's a lot of turkeys. Here are spots where from the 70s to early and mid 90s, where uh, turkeys were relocated from New mostly New York State in the Berkshires. So the first introduction, introduction from New York was in the Berkshires in 1970s, 72 to 73. And from 78 to 96, birds were introduced to multiple counties around the Commonwealth other than Norfolk County where we currently live. Here's a breakdown of how many birds were introduced to how many different regions. Uh, you can look at this chart. Uh, there's three different slides. I'm just gonna go over them very quickly. You can take a look. None of them in Norfolk County. They're all Northeast, Midwest, and far Western part of the state and south, Southwest, southerly part of the state. Worcester County, Plymouth County, Middlesex, Dukes, Essex, um, Bristol. So every other part of the state except Norfolk County. But they came here, you're now all over Norfolk County. Um, we have a nuisance population of Eastern wild turkeys everywhere in every town of the South Shore of Massachusetts in Norfolk County. Again, um, Halifax, Plymouth County. The, the 50 or so birds released in Plymouth County are now thousands of birds in Norfolk County. So population of migration patterns, unlike other birds, turkeys really do not migrate and live their entire lives in the area. That is a specific town to county where they were born. But over time, males will move elsewhere to seek out females in other areas to repopulate. Uh, there are approximately, as I mentioned, 30 to 35,000 wild turkeys in Massachusetts and 7 million wild turkeys in the, the uh, lower 48. That's a lot of turkeys. 7 million turkeys in the United States, the lower 48, not counting Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, they spend their days feeding in upland forests and open fields or even your front or backyards. I had um, a female turkey and her nine baby turkeys come into my backyard three years ago and spent all day feeding in our garden. Mom gathered all of our squash plants into a pile. All the babies retreated underneath her on top of our squash plants, and they stayed there all day feeding on our vegetable plants. I wasn't too happy, but I got the pictures. That's all that matters. Uh, they're also a nuisance. They live amongst us. They feed on bird feeders here on the left-hand side. That's the Randolph, uh, Randolph Braintree border on Pond Street. They're on um, lawn furniture in the backyard in Braintree. They're right behind people's houses in the right-hand photo. They can be anywhere on your property, front, backyard, in your driveways. They're everywhere. They're not afraid of us. They will fly up to 30 to 40 feet into a tree to roost at night to escape from most predators. Uh, however, in Maine, there is a big predation problem with bobcats have been documented to follow these large birds up into a tree to hunt them. Bobcats can climb trees. Other predators like coyotes and Canada lynx, which we have coyotes everywhere, but Canada lynx are pretty much exclusive to northern Maine and extreme northern parts of Vermont and New Hampshire, but they don't come this far south. They hunt snowshoe hares, which we don't have here. So we don't have Canada lynx, but these small cousin bobcats are moving into this area and they're a big problem in southern Maine. Here's a female turkey known as a hen. Uh, they eat early in the day and later in the evening. They are creatures of habit. They'll feed on berries, acorns. I'm gonna move this out of the way so I can see what I'm looking at. Uh, bird seed, snails, lizards, grasses, grasshoppers, sand and gravel. Birds have to eat sand and gravel because unlike humans and mammals, we have digestive fluids on our stomachs that will break down the foods that we eat. Birds don't have that. They have to ingest sand and gravel that with them moving about and flying will move that sand and gravel around the food and break that food down so they can digest it. Uh, they're, they're considered omnivores because they eat both plants, plant matter and animals in the form of insects and small lizards. Uh, physical features. Female on the left-hand side of the screen has brown, brown colored, oh my goodness, brown colored feathers which cover their entire body. There are no rec at no red at all around their head or neck area. They do not gobble. The males do all the gobbling. They're a smaller bird, they're two to three feet tall and weigh about nine pounds. On the right-hand side, we have a male called a tom or a gobbler, and he's displaying his plumage during spring mating season. 
to entice, entice a female to mate with him. Um, it's the only tur turkey that gobbles, and their gobbles their gobble is audible up to a mile away by other members of the species. The males are larger. They're up to three feet tall and weigh up to 25 pounds. These are big birds. They can fly short distances, maybe the length of a football field, and they will attack you if they perceive you to be a threat or if you're getting between them and a female that they're trying to mate with in the springtime. Uh, let's do some labeling here. Here's the anatomy of a turkey. We have the tail feathers of the male. The female does not display her feathers like the male does. They have wing feathers for flying. And even though they're 25 pounds, 25 pounds, they can fly short distances to escape predators. They all have, both the male and female, have a sharp spur behind the middle of their leg area that when the male is coming at you, he'll put his feet forward towards you to expose the spurs, and he will attack you with those spurs if he perceives you as a threat or you're getting in his way from getting together with a female. Birds have ears that are below the feathers. You don't see them like humans or other mammals. They have very sharp eyes. They can see you coming from over a mile away before you see them. The males develop what's called the snood, fatty tissue that grows from the top of the head over the front of the beak down to around the middle of the throat area. And that's usually bright red in color during mating season. Uh, they have major caruncles, which again, if I, I'm going to minimize this. Um, major caruncles, they look like red golf ball size growths around their throat. Only the males have that in their bright red during mating season only. The rest of the year, they kind of get ingested into their throat and go back a little bit. And they have breast feathers. The male will have a beard hanging down from in front of his chest. And depending upon the length of that beard, we can determine the age of that particular bird. And they have three-toed feet that are quite large. Uh, adaptations and physical characteristics of this animal that help them to survive. Wing feathers allow the bird to fly away quickly from predators or to fly up to a perch to sleep at night. Uh, and they usually are creatures of habit. They'll usually uh, perch in the same tree every night. So if you have turkeys nearby where you live, they're sleeping up in a tree not too far from your home because they don't wander that far during the daytime, maybe up to a mile, but they always go back to the same perch in the evening. They have sharp spurs or talons on the back of their legs to show dominance and to fight other turkeys. That's the males will fight other turkeys. They have sharp eyes and a keen sense of hearing to protect themselves and see and hear predators and to hear potential mates to mate with. Turkey life cycle. They start as eggs. Um, they remain eggs for 27 to 28 days from the last egg being laid to when they hatch out. And let me explain that. When turkey females lay their eggs, she will lay, she will deposit one egg per day in her nest. And turkeys around here will have a clutch or a group of eggs that number anywhere from nine to 15 eggs per season, per spring season. And she'll lay one egg per day until her last egg has been deposited in the nest. And it's a very shallow nest. I'll show you a photo of it shortly. And the incubation period starts from that point. Those eggs that were laid 15 days early are still viable and they will hatch 27 to 28 days once she starts incubation. Once they hatch, young turkeys are called poults until they're 21 weeks old after hatching, after which point a young male is called a jake, a young female is called a jenny, and that's until they're one year and five months old. And then they're considered to be an adult. On the right-hand side, we have an adult male or tom displaying during spring, uh, spring mating season. Here on the left-hand side is a clutch of eggs up in Poland, Maine. I can't tell you the exact location. I'm sworn to secrecy. But you can see the female just gathered some pine needles on the bottom underneath a pine tree, a low-growing pine tree in the middle of a swampy area to protect them from predators. Uh, they lay between 5 and 20 eggs called a clutch. But our average up here in New England is 9 to 15 eggs. And the average is actually 11 eggs. If you, if you take the totality and average out how many eggs the biologists are monitoring in all the states in New England. They'll hatch in 27 to 28 days, depending on the weather and temperatures. Wild turkey eggs are very pretty with brown spots. You know, all over the surface of the, as the shell that you can see on the right-hand side. And these are about three to four times the size of a chicken egg you buy in a supermarket. So they're large eggs. 
They're not small like a chicken egg we would find in a store. On the left-hand side is the mother and six poults crossing the street from my front yard here in Braintree about four years ago. These turkey poults are about, oh, four months old. Uh, and on the right-hand side is a turkey poult hiding underneath of one of my bushes in my front yard near my house. Um, they try to blend in using camouflage, but when you're a brown bird sitting in, in front of and underneath a bunch of greenery, you stand out pretty pronounced. But they don't like to come out in the open. They, they stay right on the conversion zone from the end of the lawn or the forest to where there's cover. Mom teaches them quite well. On the left-hand side, we have a young turkey, a male called a Jake. He's less than a year and five months old. Now you see, he has some red developing around the head. He has the beginning of a snood, but it's not really developed. And a little bit of red around the neck area, but no major caruncles like you'd see in an adult turkey uh, male that's fully mature. On the right, we have a hen or a Jenny. Uh, a young female turkey that's less than five, a year and five months old is called a Jenny. All females, whatever the age class, are always brown in color. They like to hide from predators, and the males will try to draw away a predator when they're in mating season. Males are called gobblers, and they're the adult males. They have round around the neck. You can see here major caruncles, like three almost golf ball sized red gatherings underneath the neck area. The rest of the neck is bright red, and they have the snoods hanging down over their heads and over their, their uh, beaks. Uh, they have, and they have beards hanging down from the front of the chest. This beard is probably four or five inches long, which tells me this male has got to be three to four years of age. This beard is about um, an inch or two shorter. So this male on the right-hand side of the screen has got to be about two to three years old. And the biologist, basically every inch of growth is a year on the planet. So if you see a beard that's five inches long, that bird's probably four to five years old. They don't live much longer than that because of predation and hunting. Turkeys are actively hunted all around the Commonwealth during specific times of year. I'm not gonna get into that. You can go to Mass Wildlife or contact your local police department to find out when, how, and what method of turkey hunting is available in the Milton area. I know there is hunting in the Blue Hills. Uh, gobblers put on a fancy display of their feathers during mating season, which these two birds are on the left-hand side are doing. They fluff up their feathers. They become twice as big. They fluff up their, their tail feathers uh, and fluff up all the feathers around their body to look much bigger to attract the female to try to mate with them. I'm also told by biologists the mating, the mating process lasts about 10 seconds, and the biologists that study these birds for 20 years have never seen it because it happens so quickly. I'm not going to get into details of that because I've never seen it to describe it. Here we have three males, three toms gobbling, facing off to the right. Again, the toms are the only ones who gobble. They lean their head and neck forward and gobble. There's no movement at all in the neck or throat area, but this loud sound comes out of their mouth. It's amazing to observe. Uh, you can hear them going gobble, 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 but nothing's moving. They just extend their throats out and you hear the sound. There's no vibrating in the chest. There's no vibrating in the throat, nothing. Uh, the gobble can be heard up to a mile away. In this photo, there are three facing the direction of a nearby uh, a female who is probably 15 feet off to the right-hand side of this picture, uh, feeding on the grass, paying no attention to these males at all. She was totally disinterested. Here's a female or a hen. Um, they don't have any red around their throats at all. The females do not fluff up their feathers to show dominance to attract like the gobbler does. The hen will lay one egg, one clutch of eggs every spring or between five to 20 eggs, with the average being 11 eggs here in New England. They lay more eggs to further south you go where it's a warmer, longer growing season. Now the hen in the middle in this photo is being is feeding on small insects while the two toms show off their feathers to entice her to mate with them in April to May of every spring. This is on the randolph Braintree border, uh, very close to the, um, we call it our reservoir. It's called Great Pond. If you're familiar with the Braintree randolph Holbrook Reservoir drinking water area, this is off of Pond Street, uh, a house that abuts a forest across from Blue Hill Cemetery. Um, we used to see the turkeys there every spring. I have not seen them back for the last one to two years. 
being safe around turkeys, to prevent conflict with turkeys, don't feed the birds, clean up the area around bird feeders, do not be intimidated by a turkey, protect your guard by putting in a fence with, um, we usually hang, we string wire across our garden and hang down small metal pie plates that'll flap in the breeze. That's enough to detract the turkeys and scare them away. Um, you can cover shiny reflective objects during mating season because that attracts the turkeys into you and you don't, want, you don't want to attract them into you. Now let's look at some research. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. That's as far as I can I'm going to put it in the very bottom here. Uh, photo documentation. This is main research. I went up with um, a main bird ornithologist, a bird researcher up in Maine with the Maine Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we were in the Poland, Portland area uh, during the spring, the springtime during mating season. And then I went up with them near Bangor, Maine in the wintertime in February when they netted uh, some birds for uh, research in the wintertime. Well, let's, let's start with the spring. Here is a transmitter affixed to the back of a female. Uh, they put the transmitter on the females to track where they go. When they're stationary for a certain period of time, they know they're on a nest. They'll go in with binoculars and telescopes to look from a distance and not disturb her so she can incubate her eggs in peace and quiet. Uh, they set up a research station in the back of their pickup truck and they conduct the research. Here's the transmitter taken from a bird that was predated on by a bobcat. Um, he showed me the remains of the bird. The bobcat was quite thorough with its meal, and all that was left was the radio transmitter that was strung around the bird's chest area, and they recovered the transmitter because they were able to track it down. It still emits a signal after the bird has been killed. Here is the researcher um, using a radio, tra a radio transmitting receiver it uses a directional antenna to aim in the direction of where the females are, and he can dial in with his machine to strengthen the signal to get closer and closer to the bird. This shows the frequency and a very strong signal. So we were literally 10 feet away from where the female was. She, he had six bars, which means we were right on top of that bird. He uses a telescope on a, a, tri um, a tripod to look off in a distance to try to identify individual birds. Uh, he's been working with this species for 25 years. So he's very, very good at identifying individuals that he's seen over previous years and identifying males from females from a great distance. Here he is gathering eggs from the nest. Here's the nest in the background. I'm circling it with my mouse. There is a clutch of 12 eggs underneath a very short growing pine tree that he did a flow test to determine how long the eggs were there and how long they've been incubated. So here we have a clutch of 12 eggs in a nest in Poland, Maine, in the middle of a swampy area. Uh, we were chasing turkeys around with a radio tracking system for about five hours until we finally came across this bird an hour and a half before sunset. I thought I was going to get skunked. So how is, here he's doing a flow test. He's got the egg in, the, in a, um, a water container. It's laying perfectly flat along the bottom of the container which based upon this chart says that egg was laid and deposited within one to three days before we visited. So the female has just started incubating these, these eggs. They're one to three days old. And he, he did the flow test with all 12 eggs to determine that they were all the same age and all in good health, developing normally. Now we visited them again in February and they had a net inside of a wood enclosure that they use black black powder to shoot off a net with um, window weights on the end to drag the net out and trap the birds that were in a feeding area. I'm pointing with my finger. You can't see that. Right here, they put a bird feed in the middle of wintertime. Birds will gather around that. Three turkeys were there, and we have a sequence now of this bird that's being trapped with the um, black powder propelled net to trap them and bring them down to the ground. That's six frames in one second. Now the researchers are very carefully disentangling the birds from the net. Here, one of the males um, getting ready to mate because it was February. They they start their breeding season up in Maine in February and March. 
uh, sticking his head out from the neck to say hi. And when I took the picture, I'll, the biologist up here is um, checking the tags on its legs to see if he had any and untangling him from the net. And once they successfully did that, you put all the birds in a box because the birds stay calm if they stay in a dark environment. So they put them in a cardboard box with holes to allow them to breathe. And they close the box up so the birds stay calm while they process each individual bird. You can see there's plenty of snowpack in February up in Bangor in the early part of March in February. Now they're checking out the physical shape of the, the male turkey that they just captured, looking at his flying feathers. Underneath the flying feathers are the feathers that he displays during mating season. Uh, this particular bird is for, courtesy of the biologist that I showed you. His name is Kelsey Sullivan. He's an ornithologist or a bird specialist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife based out of Bangor. So he had to travel from Bangor. I had to travel from Braintree. We met um, either in Poland, Maine, or in, um, just south of Bangor, depending upon what time of year it was that I was following him. This particular bird has um, a flu that kills turkeys up in Maine. Thankfully, we don't see it that often here in Massachusetts. But they do have a significant problem with birds contracting this virus and dying from it with growths all over their head and neck. They basically suffocate. First thing they do is when they capture a bird is they put two bands, one on each leg, using pliers to connect them together and squeeze them together. Then they use a rivet gun to secure them onto the legs. There's two bands because one is for the state, one is for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And when anybody hunts and kills one of these animals, they require by state law and federal law to turn those bands in and tell them exactly where the bird was, was taken. So they can track if it's migrated, where it's migrated to, where it was born. They have the entire biology and history on every bird up in Maine that they've ever tracked. Putting bands on the second leg, you can see the band on the first leg on the left-hand side right here. You're putting a second band here. And this researcher is drawing blood using a small pipette out of the vein on the leg of the turkey. Pardon if it's a little bit graphic for some, but uh, they draw the blood to check for viruses. They also do DNA analysis to check the lineage of the bird, where it came from, who its parents were. And they have a history dating back to 20 years when they started their research. They measure the length of the beard on the males. Uh, this beard looks like it's about five inches long. He's doing it in the metric system. I work in, in Imperial, so it's five inches long. I don't know what it is in, in uh, the metric system. I apologize for that. They measure the length of the legs, the length of the talons, the length of the toes, the girth of the animal, every dimension that they can get. They take measurements and they record it for each individual bird. Here's, uh, here's Mr. Sullivan recording data in a data sheet for each bird that they ta they tagged and they captured on the back of his pickup truck. And a very cold February morning, I must add, it was bitterly cold that day. And they'll release the birds exactly where they caught them. They're letting this Jake go back in the backyard where they were, after they retrieved the net, they just let the, the male go. And he flew back off into the woods where he'd meet his fellow turkeys. Does anybody have any questions about wild turkeys? Now is a great time to unmute yourself and ask questions. Everyone's very quiet, Bob. I don't like that. Did I not do a good job or do people <laughs> know all about turkeys and, and got everything out of this presentation? Not a single question about turkeys or? Oh, yes. How long does it take for the eggs to hatch? It takes the eggs 27 to 28 days depending upon weather and temperatures, after the female has laid the last egg in her clutch that spring. So if it takes her two weeks to lay 14 eggs, the countdown doesn't start until she actually sits on them and starts to incubate those eggs. So if she lays 14 eggs 14 days later, she'll sit on the nest, incubate those eggs, and 27 to 28 days from that point, they will hatch out. And Bob, they're good eating, huh, those eggs? Is it like eating, even though they're so much bigger? Are they? Um, I'm told that they make a really big scrambled egg. <laughs> Although I, I don't harm anything I photograph. I take pictures and leave only bubbles if I'm underwater and yeah. above water. I don't even like to touch anything to, to harm it. I'm afraid to hurt anything. Yeah. So I've never eaten a turkey egg. I only eat what I can get at a supermarket. 
whether it be an egg or uh, any bird that I might want to eat for a meal, I get it at a supermarket. Um, I don't, I won't hunt anything. Um, if something threatens me, I stay still and let it go around me and not pose a threat yeah. to the animal yeah, or good. retreat into my vehicle and close the door very quickly. That's good. That's good. Um, so, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Patty. Um, I live in Quincy, um, right along Furnacebrook Parkway, and I have families of turkeys that really are a nuisance. And I heard you say, on the one hand, they're not afraid of us. They can attack us, but you also said, don't be intimidated. I, I tend to make like loud noises if I want to go out with my, my little pup here so he can do business. Um, I, I'm just, I guess I'm asking, what is the best way to handle that? And they also seem to be, please forgive me for saying, very dumb animals. Um, they just seem to kind of go, ab are they dumb animals? They're very smart animals. Oh, okay. but they are such. They are the they are the largest upland game bird in North America. There's okay. no there's no game bird bigger than a turkey. Okay. Yeah, remember Patty? You and I talked about that. To yes, how bright they were. You have a very good memory. Yes. <laughs> Male, uh, pheasants and quail and every other type of bird that somebody might hunt is smaller than a turkey. They are the largest game bird that we have in the in the continental United States. They're not stupid, but they're not intimidated by people. So okay. if they come across as being unintelligent, it's because they're not afraid of you and they're so acclimated to people. They're not afraid of us anymore, which is not good for them or us. So what is the best way to handle it when you, you do? You... Raise your hands up over your head. Just if, if you were um, joining us for my coyote presentation a couple of years ago, um, when you're in amongst coyotes, which you have all over the place, if we're in Parkway and Quincy, along with Milton and Branchery. Yes, I yes, live. absolutely. Yeah. Put your, put your arms up in the air, make as much noise as you can, clap your hands together. If you have a whistle or an air horn, blow it and slowly walk out of the area, maintaining eye contact with the birds. They're not after your pet. Okay. It's a different question altogether with a coyote or a bobcat, a black bear. They might go after your pet. They're not after your pet. They perceive, they may perceive your pet or you as a threat to them. That's the only way that they would attack you. So when, anytime I see wild turkeys, I give them as wide a berth as I possibly can. So if I'm out walking, we go, we go on walks in state parks all around the South Shore. Borderland State Park, Wampatuck State Park, everywhere we can find a place to go walking around. We see turkeys everywhere. If I see a, if I see a, a flock of birds, I'll give them at least a 50-foot wide circle around them. I don't want them to think that I'm, in, I'm encroaching on their space. So I give them as wide a berth as I physically can. And that will typically, they will not, they will ignore you. Mm -hmm. They're not they after you. They're not well, after your pet. They don't start like chasing after you. Not but... normally. The only time that they will do that, and this will be the male, will be April and May during mating season. And actually because starting they, wanna, February, they, they wouldn't want to mate with humans, would they? You have to understand. You have to understand. <laughs> they have a limited time frame in which they can connect with a female to have babies. Hmm. I'm going to try to say this as politically correct as I can. They perceive you as getting in the way. They might attack you. Mm -hmm. wow. They have their minds on one thing and one thing only. You don't want to detract them from that activity. Oh, okay. So this is a good time to ask you another question from Marcella. She said, how many turkey babies usually survive if there's up to 20? Well, 20 turkeys would be down south, the southern part of the country. Up here, we have more. 11 is the average. Uh, in this clutch I saw in Maine, there's 12 eggs. There's at least a 50% survival rate. Um, unless humans get involved, and I'm not going to get into a sad story about what happened with the birds that I saw in my yard. My neighbors weren't very bright with how they did things. They they entrapped several babies in a net and the babies perished. Yeah. Um, so if you see if you see wildlife, give them a, a wide berth, leave them alone. They are wild animals and they're designed to be wild and let's leave, just leave them alone and give them their space. Um, the six pulse in the bottom middle picture that you see here, that's how many I first saw. And I saw them when they became adults too, the six survived. So I don't know how many mom started with, but the six of these babies survived. So it's at least a 50% survival rate. Um, where there are predators like 
coyotes and bobcats and even foxes, they will predate on the eggs of the turkeys. So if, if mom's not able to camouflage them or shoot the predators away by drawing them away from her eggs, the, the, these, these eggs can be predated on by raccoons, possums, foxes, coyotes, uh, crows will eat a turkey egg. There are many predators of turkey eggs. Well, in natural wild turkey, na wild predators, not those of us that would buy them in a store somewhere that are already processed. Um, they'll so eat the, the survival turkey rate eggs. averages about 50 per Say that again? Uh, you'll eat, they'll eat the turkey eggs, but what animals would eat the turkey? Um, coyotes would eat a turkey. Bobcats would eat a turkey. Black bear, if they were hungry enough, would eat a turkey. I don't know if a fox is strong enough to take down an adult turkey, but a fox could definitely take down a juvenile. We have red fox and gray fox around Milton and Braintree. You don't see them in the nocturnal, but they're here. There are gray fox, which are native to New England, and red fox, which are introduced from Europe. They're all over the United States. So gray fox can escape other predators like coyotes. By their, Gray fox can climb trees at night to escape coyotes. Wherever there is a strong population of coyotes, the red fox populations greatly diminish because the coyotes will hunt and kill the red fox. But the gray fox can survive and climb a tree to get away from a coyote. Another program for another day. Another day, yeah. Now, does anybody else have questions? You can unmute yourself and ask them or just type them in the chat. But at this point, okay, so one more question here, Bob. In okay. summer, I see big groups of turkeys. In winter, often just perhaps two. Why? Uh, in winter time, the birds are trying to forage for food and survive. I have heard reports of a couple of hundred birds down in the Rentham Foxborough area in open fields in wintertime, say February on snowpack. I have yet to witness that myself, but I've heard the same happens up in Maine and elsewhere in New England. And that's just in February, the birds are practicing mating behavior. Uh, males will start to fluff their feathers, their heads, necks, and snoods are starting to grow and turn red, but they're not in mating season yet. All of New England, the mating season is all of the month of April and May. That's when they're actively mating and seeking out mates. But they will congregate in large numbers sometimes in wintertime um, to practice. They're, they're social animals. They don't, they're not solitary animals. Um, coyotes will gather in family units. Bears will be in family units. Foxes, family units. Most, mammally, most, mam most mammals are family-oriented. And they stay together as a family unit for at least a certain period of time. Birds are the same way. Turkeys stay together as a family unit. And when they become sub-adults at a year and five months old, they can reunite with their parents and get together in a larger flock to, to feed, feed on food source. Um, I see a lot of turkeys out in fields, farming fields, after the crop's been harvested. They're feeding on what's left. Hmm. And they can be large flocks. This time of year, uh, although it's kind of funny, turkey seems to know when Thanksgiving's coming around because around Thanksgiving time, I don't see turkeys for a month or so. Uh, I don't know. If they, I don't know if they I sense know. that it's that time of year and they just go someplace else. They're but I never see turkeys during the month of November. I don't know what it is. I don't know if they're astute enough to figure out. Uh, we, you know, they have this country has some weird traditions and we should avoid it. Yeah, I don't know. But in the winter they're time, smart. They're smart. In, in, they are they are intelligent birds, but they're so acclimated to us that to to us they're rather complacent. They're not afraid of us anymore. They're so acclimated to people that they just ignore us. And oh, just this this things that this things in my in my habitat. Because remember, they were here before we were. All oh. wild animals were here before our families came over from Europe and elsewhere. So, Bob, you said the father turkeys are devoted to the mother and the babies for a period of time. No, the father, after he propagates the female, goes about to find more females to do the same thing. And it's not unusual for the female to mate with multiple multiple partners in a season. And that's to um, diversify the DNA base. So right. we don't have siblings mating with siblings over and over again, diluting the DNA of the animals and making them less wild per se it's like humans we don't we don't usually get together with first cousins and have children thank you we like to diversify the, the gene pool 
So we try to we try to get together with people that are not relatives. Yes. And have families with people who are not relatives. Uh, some cultures that varies, but in general, that's usually the way. Interesting. So um, does that answer your question or did I not answer it? Um, which question? The ones, the one about the fathers? Yeah, the fathers basically yeah. have no no involvement with raising the young. Once the, once, the, once the turkey eggs have been hatched, mom is the sole caregiver for the turkeys. Mm -hmm. It may be a male that joins them for protection, but because more turkeys that stay together, there's less, there's more likelihood one of the babies is going to be in versus dad. So he's a, he's a chicken turkey, so to speak. Um, I have seen males and females congregate together once the young have been born, but the, the father has no parental duties. It's all up to the mother teaching the young how to survive. And, and then when they're a year and a half old, she shoes them away. So they only mate with other turkeys. They don't mate with yes, other they birds. don't they don't mate with any other species of bird other at all. Birds. There's no there's no hybridization of turkeys like we saw with coyotes. With coyotes. Okay, so Patty has another question. What is the reason to raise your arms in the air to get away from turkeys? To shoo them away. Scare them. Yeah. To scare, scare them away. Uh if they start this, if they start, if you perceive them as being aggressive towards you, put distance between you and the turkeys. If they follow you, turn, steer them down. Raise your arms up in the air, yell at them, whistle at them, shake your car keys, whatever you have to make a lot of noise. Bang stick to, sticks together. That's usually enough to drive them away and get, let you get to safety. But they're only going to go after you if they perceive you as a threat during mating season of April and May or a female has young with her. If the female has young and you approach that female and the young, she's going to protect her youngsters. Yeah. She will go at you and protect her young. Protect her young. Um, okay. but other than that, turkeys leave us alone. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen, I've seen videos online on different Facebook uh, pages that I follow of in Quincy and a brain tree and a Randolph turkey circling a dead cat on the road or circling the mailman or something like that. And it's only because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The turkeys have no interest in humans other than to have nothing to do with us. Hmm. Okay. So another question from Patty, do turkeys carry disease? Turkeys do carry disease, but not transferable to humans. They carry avian flu, which is only transmittable to other birds, not humans. Well, and they would have to bite you, right? And They, have they would have beak. to bite you or scratch you with their talon. Um, but they have, they have a beak, so they can't really bite you. They, they don't bite. They don't peck at you with their beak. The only way that they would attack you is using the, the sharp talons in the bottom of their legs, mm -hmm. above their ankles. That um, The razor sharp talon that sticks out from behind on both legs on both the male and female turkey. But again, they're not going to bother you. Okay. Um, if, if you see a flock of turkeys, just give them a wide berth when you're walking your pet. They're going to leave you alone. If they start to follow you, it's not because they want Rover or Fluffy if it's a cat. It's because they perceive you to be a threat or your pet to be a threat, and they're trying to shoo you away. So the best way to, to get them to back off is to leave the area. So the stories I heard are that they congregate. I live in Dedham, and so in Riverdale, they were congregating around people when they were trying to go out to their driveway to the car. Like they would kind of crowd around them. Right. They're not afraid of people. That's the problem. Yeah. And this, there's frequent times I'm driving around Braintree, Randolph, and Quincy, and Milton, and turkeys, entire flocks of turkeys cross the road. Right. And they look at me like, what do you want? And they'll stop in the middle of the road. They're not in a hurry. You can beep the horn. They just look at you and kind of go, yeah, what do you want? Yeah, I see yeah, them. They, I've seen them. They, give you, they give you attitude. They're not afraid or intimidated <laughs> by people anymore. They're brave. Yeah. They're just not intimidated. They're so used to us now. They're so acclimated to people that we don't, we don't, up in Maine, for example, classic example. The birds up in Maine are truly wild turkeys. They don't have any involvement or interactions with people. I went out with uh, Mr. Sullivan to Poland, Maine, and we saw several birds about 100 yards away out in an open field at the edge of a forest. He said, Bob, carefully go around the edge of the, the perimeter of the field to try to take your pictures of the turkeys. I no longer got off the side of the road and they bolted into the forest from a mile away. In Braintree and Randolph, I could get to within 10 feet of turkeys, and they didn't care that I was 10 feet away from them. 
because they're so used to people, they're not, they don't, they're not afraid of us anymore. Where in North Country or in other parts, rural parts of the country, they're still wild birds and they stay away from people. You can't approach a turkey up in Maine. They're, they're going to run away from you. You're never going to get close enough to one. But down here, where there's so many turkeys and so many people, we have such a dense population in Milton, Braintree, Quincy, and Randolph that turkeys are everywhere and so are people. And they're just used to us. Yeah. And we don't intimidate them anymore. Interesting. So make a lot of noise and slowly get out of the area, maintaining eye contact, and they're not going to bother you. They're not after you or your pets. They just perceive you as a threat and they're trying to get rid of you. Does anybody else have any questions? Everyone's very quiet. So, Bob, do they fly? Turkeys can fly, and I witnessed it myself. We had a female turkey. We had her turkey poults, there were nine of them, came between a post and the side of my house and into my backyard. They crawled between that space. They were five-day-old baby turkeys. I had a biologist verify that for me. They were five-day-old baby turkeys that just hatched nearby. Mom flew over the fence to join him in our backyard, and I saw her fly. Then I saw her fly. Another turkey flew up into a tree in my front yard, about 20 feet off the ground. Oh, so they can fly short distances up to about 100 yards and then their bodies, they get tired. Their body mass outweighs what they're capable of flying. They can't fly long distances to migrate. So turkeys stay around in the same area. But they can fly to escape a predator or fly up into a tree to roost at night. Turkeys do not sleep on the ground at night. They all fly up into a tree to sleep at night. They have kind of small wings, right? Uh, small enough wings, but powerful enough to lift the 25 pound male off the ground and up into a tree. And the thing that you see is that big tail. It's yeah. not the wings. Yeah. Okay. We have another question, Bob. Okay. From Patty. Why do you give the turkey direct eye contact if you want to get away from them? I have found in my experience as a wildlife photographer, no wild animal likes being steered down. I'm trying to convey to every wild animal that I encounter in the wild that I'm the alpha, don't mess with me. Just if you like turn with the around, coyotes, the coyotes, you taught us that. Coyotes, right? in, yeah. in my experience with black bears that you'll see in January, and Gene will talk about that shortly. Um, yes, when I, was, everyone when, I was up in, when I was I, up in North Country in June of last year, they released 18-month-old black bears that were rehabilitated in a place in um, the New Hampshire-Vermont border. And when they released the, the, the black bear, one of them charged right at me. He stopped five feet away from me and I just stood, I stood my ground and just took pictures of him. I wasn't, I wasn't, I thought I was toast, but I wasn't afraid. The last thing you want to do from any predator type animal is turn and run away. Because with any animal that's a predator, a coyote, a bobcat, a black bear, any other wild animal like that, you're going to, you're going to trigger an attack because you're telling that wild animal you're a prey species and you're trying to run away from them. That's the last thing you want to do from any wild animal. So with predators, you want to steer them down. Now in a turkey, who's an omnivore, is still a predator, not of us, but they're still a predator. They eat other small animals. They'll eat um, reptiles, insects. Um, they're still predators. So steer them down. They don't like to be steered down by a mammal. I they... convey to them, I'm the alpha. I'm in charge of this flock. Leave me alone. Do they eat other birds? No. No. They'll only eat reptiles, li um, small lizards, snakes, um, insects, and grains and, and grass. And grass. They don't eat other animals. They don't eat other birds. Marcella wants to know: Do they migrate? Do they guard their territory? Uh, turkeys are territorial, so we see the same turkeys every year. They usually have a one to two mile range from where they were born, and they seldom leave that two mile area. So if you've got flocks of turkeys in Squantum, they've always been there. Uh, they're not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And as the population expands, you're just going to see more of them. In Milton or in Dedham, where you live, Gene, mm -hmm. you see turkeys. Those turkeys don't live more than two miles from your house. Hmm. And I you'll see, see the same turkeys every year if they survive long enough. I see them when I drive home from Milton to Dedham on Dollar Lane. They come out sometimes the, in this turkeys like other animals are creatures of habit 
Yeah. And I can go to the same places in Braintree and Randolph, driving along the same time every morning or every afternoon. And sure enough, there are the turkeys crossing the road again. Same time of day, morning and afternoon. They're creatures of habit. Kind of home bodies. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then at night, at night they're gonna they're gonna go back to their, their home area and they're gonna roost in the same tree that they've been sleeping in for months. Hmm. Okay. And they stay in that tree, they don't leave the area. Yeah, which is interesting. So, so in now I'm from Vermont. So the the turkeys in Vermont are probably like the ones in Maine. They don't see that many people, right? Depends I mean, upon if it's. Are you talking Burlington, Vermont, or rural well? Vermont? So my brother-in-law and his his daughter-in-law, my sister's husband and uh, her daughter-in-law, they were driving on the back road in the country, and they saw a moose and they slammed on the brakes and they didn't hit the moose and he lumbered off. And then right after that splat on the window sill was a wild turkey. Okay. I and mean, the bird, again, the bird again, not a bottle, right? Sorry? A bird, not a bottle. <laughs> a bird. And it okay. was right before Thanksgiving. And when they told us that story at Thanksgiving dinner, we're like, Chuck, why didn't you bring this turkey home for us to have, to have for, uh, for dinner? It was just a little tough. But... Well, wild turkeys are not the greatest eating because of yeah. them running around and flying. They've developed a lot of muscle in their body. And they're very tough to eat, I understand. Sinewy. So the turkeys that I have in our freezer right now from for Thanksgiving this year, I got them at a supermarket. Yeah. They're domestically raised turkeys. They're much more tender with a lot more breast meat, which is what we like to eat. Yes. All right. Is there anybody have any other questions? People who have uh, stuck with us? I just want to tell you that on, and I put this in the chat, Tuesday, January 9th, I'm asking Bob to come back to talk about the life of the black bear in New England, right? Coming to a neighborhood near you. They're already denning as far east <laughs> as Worcester. Yep. And they're going to be in Milton and Quincy and Braintree within the next five to 10 years. We already see rogue males. We see them on the news much more frequently because there's a lot more of them around. Yeah. Uh, females usually range anywhere from 10 to 15 miles from where they were born. Worcester's 30 miles away. I'm giving a three to five years before we start to see female black bear in Milton and Braintree. Yes. And I bet, I bet you don't want to be staring them down. Uh, you're, well, you're I don't them. want to give the story away, but that's for January. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, Hey, thank you everyone for being here. I'm glad that you joined us and um, happy Thanksgiving. I do want to leave you with this. If I could, if anybody has any questions about turkeys or any other species of wildlife, Gene, if you have my email address, you can put that up in the chat as well. Um, okay. You're welcome to send me an email. I will reply to anybody who reaches out to me. I do. I'm not, as you can tell, I'm, I'm very bashful and don't like to talk to people. Um, <laughs> and I will respond to anybody who sends me an email with an answer to your question. So yes. my email, I'll give it to you now verbally. It's pbm.inc at Verizon, like the telephone company, dot net. I am see. I'm just putting it here in the chat. Too. So PBM, Paul Boy Michael, dot like a period, indigo Nancy Charlie at Verizon.net. Oh, dot net. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for that. And thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Very welcome. And I hope to see everybody in January. Have a very nice Thanksgiving and a happy and healthy holiday season to everybody. Yes. You thank too. you. Thank Thanks, you everybody, for being here. Okay. I guess with that, we'll say good night. And right, I'll everybody. see you all next time. Bye-bye.